Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sianna. It was wonderful as always. Um, look forward to having you back at a future town hall to, to uh, talk more about those issues. So not, not a ton um, in the COVID realm. I've actually got another topic that I'm going to cover as well, but um, I think the one of the big stories, and we talked about this last week, but I, I want to emphasize it, especially for anybody who was not here last week, um, Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, um, is, as far as I know, is the first employer to get a legal challenge to their mandatory vaccine rule. Um, apparently, they have about 25,000 employees, all but um, less than 200 of them agreed to get the mandatory vaccine. Um, uh, it's a healthcare system. Um, they made a very strong legal argument as, why, as to why we need the vaccine. Um, but then about 117 employees sued um, because they were coming up on a deadline. They were suspended without pay and they were coming up on a deadline to get terminated. Um, so they sued to say, um, this is illegal. You can't mandate the vaccine. Um, Texas judge sided with the employer in this case. Um, I have a stay tuned on there because I assume that there was going to be uh, an appeal, um, generally speaking, 30 days to appeal. So we'll see what happens. But I think this is good news for employers who want to mandate the vaccine. Keep in mind, this is a healthcare setting. So I think they have a very strong argument for mandating the vaccine. Um, but it also is interesting because it is Texas. And if you have followed um, at all what's going on in Texas, we have a governor who very strongly believes that the vaccine passport should be illegal. Um, but on the other hand, Texas is a very strong employer rights state. Um, so, uh, so again, stay tuned. I think that's um, that's an interesting one. I think it sets the precedent. If you guys have been listening to my town halls for the last several months, you know I what I said was, um, you don't really want to be the test case. Our small to mid-sized employers don't want to be the test case. Let a big boy like Houston Methodist um, go out there and, and mount this legal challenge and spend what I can imagine is tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time this is over on legal fees um, to fight this. Um, so we all know about the guidance for fully vaccinated individuals. Keep in mind that fully vaccinated means two weeks post your final shot. So two weeks after your single shot of your J&J, &J, two weeks after the Moderna or the final shot of Moderna or Pfizer, um, if that's the vaccine that someone received. Um, so right now the guidance under CDC is fully vaccinated individuals can go without masks. Um, those who are not <clears throat> fully vaccinated <clears throat> should continue to wear masks. Um, and we're getting, we're still getting a lot of questions around this. This is governed in large part by state and local law. New Jersey has said still, um, we want employers to keep their employees wearing masks, whether they're vaccinated or not. Pennsylvania is a little muddier um, because uh, there is an executive order in place that talks about masking in the workplace, does not give any exception for vaccinated individuals because the executive order came out before the vaccine was widely available. So technically, um, we're still required to wear masks in the workplace in Pennsylvania. Um, June 28th, which is next week, uh, we are lifting the mask mandate completely in Pennsylvania. So it'll be interesting to see if the governor explicitly uh, or the, the Department of Health Secretary explicitly says, um, yeah, no masks at work anymore either. So, you know, keep in mind, you still have an obligation to provide a safe workplace. OSHA has kind of punted on this issue, except in the healthcare setting. OSHA just says, yeah, follow CDC guidance. Um, but keep in mind, you also can do more than the law requires. And this may get into, you know, finding out how vaccinated your employee population is and making a decision based on that. If you have 70, 80% of your employee population um, vaccinated, um, you're going to feel much more comfortable saying um, going without masks than you are if you only know that 30% um, are vaccinated. Because keep in mind, again, you've got that obligation to provide a safe workplace, but you also have operational issues. And one of the things we saw during the, you know, a year ago this time um, was employers um, who were fully in person who would um, get one case in the office, often got multiple cases in the office um, or the workplace or the manufacturing uh, uh, facility, and as a result, um, had to shut down production or had to shut down their office. So you don't want that as an employer either. Um, and also very interesting, we'll send around um, the link to this survey, but Wills Towers Watson did a return to work survey. Um, the survey identified steps employers are taking as workplaces reopen. So this is something to think about in addition to the MEA survey that we're sending around. 62% um, of employers are, who responded to the survey are providing or considering providing paid time for uh, pay for time spent getting vaccinated. 
Um, also about 60% are performing or considering um, an on-site or near-site vaccination administration for employees. Um, that was something that was not available, you know, a few months ago, but now if you wanted to set up a, an on-site vaccination clinic in your workplace and you have enough people to get vaccinated, be very similar to a flu clinic, you know, get in touch with a Rite Aid or a Walgreens or a CVS and see if you can set that up. Uh, more than half of employers are offering or considering offering additional leave for any employee who has negative reactions to the vaccine. Um, two in 10 respondents offering or considering providing financial incentives for getting vaccinated. Um, and an a majority of employers are requiring both vaccinated and unvaccinated employees to continue wearing masks indoors. So some interesting um, information there for employers to consider uh, as they make their decisions. Okay, I wanna switch gears a little bit. And again, we'll give you the link to this um, in the email that comes out afterwards, but sort of um, in observance of Pride Month, um, June is Pride Month. And also it's the, the we've just hit the one year anniversary of the Supreme Court's ruling in Bostock's v. Clayton County. As you will recall, Bostock um, was a landmark decision because um, the justices decided that uh, Title VII, the term gender in Title VII includes, includes sexual orientation and transgender transgender status as protected categories, so a really big deal. Um, so in honor of, the, of, of all that going on, EEOC has announced a new landing page and a new technical assistance document on LGBTQ plus rights in the workplace. I just pulled a couple of things out of there that I thought were, were of interest. Um, we get a, a number of questions about transgender individuals in the workplace. I think this is an area where a lot of managers and a lot of HR people don't have a lot of experience to draw upon. Um, so it is a good idea to, to talk to your lawyer um, if this comes up. But you know, just a couple of things to think about when you think about workplace attire, think about your dress code policies. Um, employers cannot require a transgender employee to dress in accordance with the employee's sex assigned at birth. Um, prohibiting a transgender person from dressing or presenting consistent with their gender identity would constitute sex discrimination. Um, similar, we have a lot, I've had a number of discussions with members over the years around bathrooms, lockers, and showers. Um, you can have separate sex, sex segregated bathrooms, um, but all men get to use the men's facilities and all women get to use the women's facilities. And that includes transgender men and transgender women. Um, so something to think about um, if you do, if your employees are changing and showering um, and dressing at work. And then finally, pronouns and names. And this builds off of um, Sianna's presentation at the law conference. Hopefully you were able to hear that. Um, the use of pronouns or names that are inconsistent with an individual's gender identity may amount to harassment. Okay, so this is an interesting one because um, first of all, it's not an issue a lot of us are familiar with. A lot of us are... Um, are not well practiced at using proper pronouns when someone has changed their identity, not always well practiced as using um, they, them, theirs. Um, so it's something that, that people need to work on in general, that workplaces need to work on in general. Um, but uh, using improper pronouns, um, dead naming someone, using um, the name that they had before they transitioned, um, all could be part of a harassment scenario or a discrimination scenario, they could be evidence. So you still um, have the same uh, threshold that you do for any other type of, of unlawful harassment. It's got to be severe and pervasive. Um, but keep in mind that this could be one piece of a claim for harassment. So if you have an employee who is transgender, particularly one who has transitioned while working for you, this is something to think about and make sure that you are taking steps to control this behavior among your employees, sensitize your employees to the importance of using proper names and proper, proper pronouns um, uh, to make sure that you uh, are doing what you need to do to comply with the law and to avoid any kind of a harassment scenario. So again, that's, I just picked out a couple of tidbits that I thought were interesting out of what the EEOC has to say. We'll send around that link um, in the email that comes out after the webinar. Thank you, Amy. Um, and, and I just want to, again, a great conversation. Um, you know, we're hearing, a, again, a lot of issues that we have to always bear in mind. There's a have to do and should do in all these. And I think we're, we're looking at a lot of the have to do's, but we also really need to be thinking about what we should be doing kind of going forward. Um, uh, Amy, I'll combine two questions. So you mentioned June 28th is when the state mandate to go massless. So the question is twofold. Does that mean that all employees can, I guess two questions, can, can all employees go massless, including those not vaccinated, or can a, com can a company decide who that non-vaccinated, you still have to wear a mask? And two, um, 
do, do, do they still need to collect vaccination records for employees at that point? So a couple of things going on there. Um, anybody who's listened to the town hall for the last six months knows that I'm a big fan of collecting vaccination records. Um, I think it's something that all employers should be doing. I think that you should have a handle on what's going on in your workplace with regard to vaccines. Again, you as an employer have a, an obligation to provide a safe workplace. I don't know how you assess that unless you know that, you know, 10% of our workforce is vaccinated, 30% of our vac you know, our workforce is vaccinated or 70 or 80%. I think it makes a difference. So I would, I would absolutely collect cards. Remember that they're confidential medical information. You keep them in a separate medical file. Um, that being said, uh, it's not 100% clear what's going to happen in Pennsylvania after June 28th. Um, would love it if it was. Um, there is still an executive order in place as of right now that says every employee should be wearing a mask in the workplace, even though the CDC has come out with different guidance. And I know when I go into workplaces, what I'm seeing is different than what that executive order says. If you walk into a Wegmans or a CVS or a Target, I would say not all of the employees are wearing masks. And I've always assumed that that's because the unvaccinated or those who are choosing to wear masks are wearing masks. Um, so it, it's a little bit interesting. So that's a little bit of a stay tuned, but also remember that you as an employer can always do more than the state says you have to do. You as an employer can always do more than the CDC says you have to do. The problem I think that, that we're facing is a practical one, which is you have employees who are fully vaccinated and they're going out in the world and they're not wearing a mask. We also probably have plenty of employees who are not fully vaccinated and they're going out in the world and they're not wearing a mask. So to get them to um, wear a mask in the workplace is becoming more and more challenging, I, I would imagine. Um, so I think that's the practical issue that we're dealing with. Um, but yes, you as an employer can continue to say everyone needs to be needs to wear a mask um, and certainly can continue to say that the unvaccinated need to wear a mask. Um, your choice. It's a it's a health and safety issue that you need to decide for your own workplace. Great. Well, once again, thank you, Amy. Thank you for all joining us today. Uh, as always, there's a lot of nuance and new things to discuss, and we'll keep uh, keep meeting with you all every Tuesday. Have a great week and uh, stay healthy.